Molecules that are polar, that have permanent non-zero dipole moments, have permanent regions of partial positive and negative charge within their structures. This means that they're essentially carrying around little regions of charge that can be attracted to other regions of opposite charge in nearby molecules. The attraction between opposite partial charges across two polar molecules is known as a dipole-dipole force. And this happens when the oppositely charged ends of two molecules approach one another and are pulled together through electrostatic attraction. So opposites attract. Take a molecule with one positive end and one negative end. If that molecule finds itself nearby another molecule such that the positive end of the second molecule is nearby the negative end of the first, those oppositely charged regions will attract one another. This is known as a dipole-dipole force. And you're seeing two orientations here in which this can happen, a kind of head-on orientation right here and a side-on arrangement like this where the two molecules are side by side but their oppositely charged regions are still relatively close to one another. Now dipole-dipole forces as we suggested are important only for molecules that contain a permanent dipole moment that is relatively large what we called polar compounds in the past and because we're dealing here with permanent dipole moments that are relatively large certainly relative to the instantaneous dipole moments that show up in London forces, dipole-dipole interactions tend to be stronger than London dispersion forces as a general rule. So we're going to keep this in mind, and when we survey the strengths of all the possible intermolecular forces toward the end of this section, we'll see it again. This problem on the surface looks very simple. We're simply asked to predict which will have the higher boiling point, N2 or CO. In essence, we've got a 50-50 shot at coming to the correct answer. But we're also asked to explain our reasoning, and this is a great opportunity to really unveil the logic associated with appreciating the connection between intermolecular forces and boiling point, melting point, and other physical properties, and understanding how Lewis structures point us to, toward the dominant intermolecular force. So the logic goes like this. I've got two molecules that I'm interested in comparing, and it may be two, it may be three, it may be five. No matter how many molecules you've got, the logic is basically the same. We have to start with a Lewis structure, an understanding of how the atoms are connected, where the electrons are located in space, what's the geometry, all that good stuff. And we do need to know that three-dimensional geometry to appreciate whether the molecule is polar or nonpolar. And this chain of reasoning we've applied before, going from the Lewis structure to a conclusion about whether the molecule is polar or not. Once we've assessed the polarity, we can get a sense of the dominant intermolecular force, whether it's London forces, dipole-dipole forces, or other types of forces we'll talk about a little bit later. We then apply the general ordering of strengths of intermolecular forces to figure out what are the relative strengths of forces in these compounds, and how does that relate to, say, boiling point or melting point. So here, we've got two molecules, N2 and CO, that we're interested in, and we start with their Lewis structures. So here are Lewis structures for N2 and CO. I encourage you to draw these out on your own and make sure you're comfortable with the formal charges, the locations of electrons, all that good stuff. The geometries, of course, both molecules are linear. And in terms of polarity, CO does have a permanent dipole moment. It involves carbon and oxygen connected to one another, opposite formal charges. There's definitely a dipole moment in that molecule. It is polar. But N2 is a nonpolar molecule, homonuclear diatomic molecule, pure covalent bond, absolutely nonpolar in every possible way. So in N2, the dominant intermolecular force is London forces. This is a nonpolar molecule. So without a dipole moment, it can't exhibit dipole-dipole forces. But CO can with its permanent dipole moment. So the dominant IMF in carbon monoxide is dipole-dipole forces. Now, in general, as we've just seen, dipole-dipole forces are stronger than London forces. This means that CO will boil only at a higher temperature than N2. The boiling point of CO is going to be greater or higher than the boiling point of N2. And the reason is, with the stronger intermolecular forces, it takes a higher temperature, more kinetic energy of the molecules in order to overcome the stabilizing effect of the intermolecular forces in CO, those dipole-dipole interactions.